is how is this oil that was thrown onto these wonderful beaches, how is that developing over time, how is it degraded, what are the physical, chemical, biological processes that are involved with the degradation of this oil. So we have the Pensacola site that I'm going to focus on, and we have our St. George site that we use as a control that supposedly received very, very little oil, if at all. So this is during Alex, Hurricane Alex. I went out there. Um, we went the first time, if I'm informed correctly, oil hit Pensacola Beach was the night of the 22nd to the 23rd of June. And we came the very day, the next day, to do our first sampling, and then I came back uh, Alex came June 25th, and then it lasted about a week that we had waves and so forth. I bring in this picture and video because <clears throat> it points out something that is hardly mentioned at all, that a lot of dispersed oil came to shore. It came as big moose, as globs, as SRB, tar balls, whatever you want to call them. But what you also see that this foam is not white as it should be. The water is pretty green at this time because it stirred up, but every single wave leaves this rim of oil. So there's oil in very, very small particles and also in dissolved form. And as you can see, the water vanishes also partly into the sand. So some of this material is transported into the sand. This is a close up, and if layers of that accumulate on top of each other, then you get this kind of structure. And if a wave, you get that structure on, on the beach, and if a wave grabs that, then you get this, and you get tar ball. So that's tar ball or SRB formation on the beach due to the interaction of waves and this layering and layering and layering and layering of very small oil particles. Some of that also in dissolved form. Now, the other question is how these guys develop. So some of these were that big. And you may have reports um, or seen reports that people claim they can get to the size of a car. Now, those are different processes. So you may have some of these very soft little tar balls that I showed earlier, and they accumulate, but this is rather something that I think is a big piece of mousse that gets thrown onto the beach and then washed around forming these very, very big tar balls. And so that's how the beach looked um, when I went there and there were these enormous big tar chunks in there or oil chunks. And they were sitting in the wash zone where these guys live. And so the, the first critters that were directly affected by the oil that was thrown onto the beach and then also washed off the beach again were these ghost crabs, the mole crab, and the surf crab. What you also can see in this picture that these organisms are very important in digging. And so they do a lot of digging. So these ghost crabs, you all know them. Whoever has been to the beach knows them. And I'll show you in my final picture how they dig up oil. But what they also do, they do these conduits into the sand that were filled with oil. So they brought oil into the sediment. The mole crab and the uh, donax, they live on the beach face, pretty much, and also in the shallow subliteral rock, and they filter. Of course, if you filter, and there's all this fine particulate oil in there, you may not like it. So after Alex came to shore and we watched this um, oil come in, these guys vanished. That doesn't mean that they died, because they're pretty mobile. So they can move in and out and go to deeper and go to shallower and come in sideways. I have not seen, and I have not seen reports either, of many being dead or killed. So I hope that most of them had a way to escape.
found that this biotubation effect was not present for quite some time while this oil was coming to shore. Now, when you walked along the beach face, and there's my wonderful boot. At that time, there was, yeah, you have to wear boots and hazmat suit and mask and goggles. And, but you see that a lot of oil was dug into the beach sand. And that was mentioned already before, there was a lot of lateral sand transport. And so oil was in the beach everywhere. We scratched up off the surface by one inch away or so. We'll have all these oil particles of all kinds of sizes. And you also saw these layers being deposited in the beach. Now we understand and we know by now that this beach was very shallow and had also a, a landward dip where this oil could accumulate and then um, Alex and other storms and other transport processes put a lot of sand on top of it. But what you also see that these were erosional cliffs. So a lot of that stuff and that stuff, especially that located in the beach face, was washed back into the ocean. Now your question was, well, what happens to that oil? When it's washed back, is that forming now tarmac, or what's going to happen? So we put on a little dive mask, and you become a tourist attraction because you are laying there on your belly in the surf zone watching the sand for hours. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the interesting part is if you, if you see that, and Prabhupada pointed it out, you have to develop an eye for tar balls. And if you develop an eye for tar balls, then you see there are a whole bunch of them in there. And so they get washed around in the surf zone. And that's, of course, something that is advancing this degradation very rapidly. And Joel pointed out, if you shake these things around, just by abrasion, by physical forces, these tar balls get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, which basically means that the surface to volume ratio changes, getting larger surface for smaller volume. The larger surface is important for bacterial colonization. So the smaller the tar balls, the more you have bacteria sitting on these tar balls, and if they get small enough, they become food. Because, first of all, a lot of critters, small critters, benthic critters, can pick them up. And then the critters don't see the tar, they see the bacteria. The bacteria can convert the oil, the critters can convert the bacteria. But that's the pathway of the hydrocarbons into the organisms. So we have pathways of oil into the invertebrates and then, of course, up the food chain. And there's various research already available now that shows by isotopic signatures, for instance, that this oil entered the food chain and then goes its way through the food chain. It does not have to scare you because it's not accumulating toxic amounts. At least I haven't seen any reports so far to extent that should be of concern. But it shows you that there's a pathway from these little tar balls, SRBs, however you want to call them, into the food chain. If you take these little tar balls, pick them up from the beach, while you were sitting there snorkeling, you pick them up in a little cup. You put them in uh, so-called benthic chambers. So those are little chambers that enclose the water volume above the shallow water sediment. You put the tar balls in there, you see them in here, and then you put a bunch of sensors in there, and then you have some control chambers, and then you observe what's happening in there with a the fluorescent sensor. And the fluorescent sensor senses typically dissolved organic carbon, but as you may know from all this oil research that has been published, oil has a fluorescent signature. It means on a certain wavelength, it starts fluorescing. And those are the cyclic components, the aromatics. What you see here, that where you have the tar balls, you see the release of these dissolved organic carbon molecules to the water column. 
and that is the control, and you can get your own idea on what is causing this increase. So the tarballs release some stuff to the water column, which is aromatics. Now these are very fresh tarballs. These are the tarballs that came to shore right after Alex, very soft, very smelly, very sticky. So there we have, at least from my point of view, some evidence that that stuff that was washed into the very shallow had the potential to release stuff to the water column. Now the dilution effect is of course enormous, and you will have a hard time to measure any substantial or halfway toxic concentrations in the water column, but on a local scale, near the sediment water interface, for an invertebrate, it may be a different story. I cannot answer this question because we could not measure it. Now what happens when you have these little tar balls that you observed in a surf zone, when they get, as we heard earlier, embedded in the sand? That happens all the time because the ripples migrate over them. They become smaller and smaller and become basically part of the ripples. When we put them in a the flume, here there's a little tar ball, and then we plastered oxygen sensitive foils to the inside of that flume. This picture shows false color oxygen concentration. Yellow and red means high oxygen, blue means no oxygen. What happens here is that we mimicked tidal flow. So what happens at any beach, whether it's calm, windy, you have a phase where there's more, fl more flow and then you have a phase with less flow. When you switch on the flume flow, the sand is very permeable, the water penetrates and brings oxygen into the sediment, also to this little tar ball. When you stop the flow, then the bacteria in the sediment consume the oxygen. And I acknowledge that this is not very clear, but around this tar ball, if you observe it closely, the oxygen does not really get back to 100%. The indication is that this tar ball in the sediment benefits from any oxygen that's transported in the sediment. So here we have a situation, which is lucky for us, that we have in the surface sediment layers aerobic conditions. And that's critical because any microbiologist who works with oil will tell you if you have oxygen available, your oil degrades. If you have no oxygen available, you will get gray hair before you see something. And so this is something that helped very much to degrade the oil that was in the tar, in the, in the beach sand, and also for the submerged tar mass. It may be a very important process. Now, on the beach, now, getting to the dry, we did what many others did as well, picked up tar balls because they are so convenient pick up, you run into them, you pick them up and put them in, in containers and observe the degradation. And you can see that the hydrocarbon content over time, well, it's not a very clear trend, I admit that, but it goes down in three minutes. No, it doesn't go down, it takes much longer than that. <laughs> and so in uh, end of July, the beach looked clean again and everybody was happy. You see the first people going back onto the beach and they gave us dirty looks because as soon as you dig it up, it's not that clean anymore. So, and that is the focus, the main focus on what we have been looking at. Because you look at the 60 centimeters or two feet deep layer of contaminated sediment. Now, what most research will focus on is this very distinct buried layer. This sediment is also contaminated. You may see it here, this faint color. And I mentioned to you earlier, there's a lot of oil that penetrated the sediment, not as tar balls, but in very, very small particles. And so that's what we have here. And so this oil sheet, you could grab the sand, it was oil. You have it in your, sand, in your hands and when you let it go, you get oily hands. So that's a different story. And so we looked at this, 
extend at this as well. And so we took a bunch of these cores and they were hardly long enough to take all this. And then we had Joel Kostka's group coming out and sampling these large trenches so they were up to 12 meters long. And you have consecutive layer of oil in there and also this, this yellow layer. And so we have the microbial data on that and we observed that over time. So we went every, every month, every other month, and later on in larger intervals to collect all this stuff. Now we heard already a bunch of about oil degradation so forth. I just want to make the point here, the, the gray bar are the source oil, the yellow bar is the buried oil in October. What we see is that there's short chain hydrocarbons, smaller components, they vanish because they can be eaten readily by bacteria. Well, all these other stuff, doesn't do too much. So it stays in the sediment relatively long, although I have to point out this is a logarithmic scale. And so there are some distinct changes. But we were impressed how much would stay there. The same applies to the um, PAHs. We have some that change quite dramatically, but in other cases, it stays relatively long. The bacteria. Initially, this is Joel Koska's work, <clears throat> so that was published here in Applied Environmental Microbiology. Initially had a big boom, a big bacteria bloom of uh, oil degrading bacteria, in this case, Alcanagorax, that then dropped down, supporting the results that we heard here also by Ed. So there's, there's various bacteria that bloomed and then um, the blooms vanished and other blooms showed up depending on the components of oil that were around. And then came these guys, and uh, we had a lot of people watching over our shoulders when we dug these trenches because we were always out there and always digging these trenches, always these. And they thought, oh, that's pretty deep. We should do something here. So they came with these bulldozers and removed this layer, basically, so t about two feet. That's the 60 centimeters that we had, and they put it in this tifting machine. And there are probably people here in the audience that know much better about the whole process, but <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> so, so this is the sifting machine. You, you throw that in here and you sift the tar balls out and then the sifted sand goes onto this pile and that pile goes back onto the beach. And that's great because you remove the big chunks of tar and so you help the beach to recover from this impact. And it looks like that in December. And we went out there and we have our beach back. It's wonderful. It's all white sand again until you dig it up. <laughs> and so maybe it's hard for you to see, but there's this layer. This is an off-white. So this sand that was put back on in, during the sifting, of course, you destroy a lot of these very fragile, as pointed out by Provocar, they're very brittle. You grind up a significant part of these SRBs. You get the big chunks out, of course, but you grind up some. I don't know how much, but <clears throat> it was sufficient to stain this layer. There are some remnants of this initial layer. And when you look at the oxygen consumption, which is a reflection of the bacterial community um, in this layer, you see that initially we had a very distinct peak of oxygen consumption where the oil was concentrated, and then this peak was broadened. But that's good news. That means that this whole layer now fed bacteria that broke down oil and helped to clean the beach. And so to look at carbon distribution, so initially we had these oil layers, very sharp peaks of oil in the sediment, and then after the deep cleaning we had this much less, order of magnitude less oil, and then just distributed over the whole depth. Is the oil gone? No. Uh, the reason for that is because we measure only a fraction of what's actually out there, which is the GC or gas chromatography amenable fraction of the oil. Because the gas chromatograph that we use for the oil analysis will only accept the nonpolar compounds. And that, when you have increased oxygen consumption, you may think it's not only the nonpolar components that you look at. And then we sent our samples to the MAG lab in, at Florida State University, and they confirmed what we thought, that 
initially the Macondo well had about 13,700 distinguishable peaks of mass and then our Pensacola stuff, 32,000. So it increased dramatically. And the reason is if you take apart this mass spectrum, which shows you basically what kind of components you have in the oil, that's also an interesting thing to respond to people who ask, well, how toxic is the oil? Well, we have 32,000 components. We have to test them. How many of those are toxic? How many are benign? How many are beneficial? But if you look at the detail of that, you realize that in this beach profile, you had all these red peaks which contain oxygen. So there are processes that oxidize this oil. There are two main processes. One is microbial, of course, and the other one is that it can be oxidized while it's at the surface, photooxidation, and then brought back into the cell. And a good colleague of mine, Christoph Epley, pointed out that biodegradation and photooxidation cause a lot of oxygenation of these hydrocarbons that now still are in the sediment, but we cannot measure them with our standard GC techniques. So we need to have these sophisticated machines that I showed you before at the MAG lab, Fourier transform cyclotron resonance mass spectrometry. And that will pick up all these little peaks. And you have also other techniques like two-dimensional gas chromatography that can pick this up. But to make a long story short, we cannot be fooled by just these standard techniques. We have to learn from the past and now go one level above, adopt new techniques to really get to these oxidized components that are still around. Now, the good news is that most of the oil is gone, <clears throat> gone, but the fraction is still persistent. It's not well defined because we have only very limited access to these very sophisticated machines that characterize the oxidized components of the oil. And that's something that should be done in the future. I need to thank a lot of people. A lot of students had to dig a lot of holes, a lot of trenches, build big muscles at 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and then we were very grateful for Gomery funding, um, NSF funding. Where's my NSF stuff? Great band. And we had collaboration with Georgia Tech and College and USF. Thank you very much for your attention.